All right. What is going on, everybody? As people are jumping in here, I see that we're filing in, getting excited, going to talk pickup and delivery uh, today. And just as people are filing in, hey, start start introducing yourself over there in the chat. Uh, put your name and maybe uh, where you live in the world. One of my favorite parts always uh, I'm Jordan from Laundromat Resource, and I am in Orange County, California. And uh, let me introduce you to the other two panelists, I guess. Uh, Savon is here. She's Director of Operations at Sense and has this big, broad perspective on things because she is talking with owners all the time. She told me not to read her bio because it's lame, which I don't think it's lame, but I thought it was awesome. But the important thing is she's a big deal. Um, But the more important thing is, is that she's talking with a lot of people who are running successful pickup and delivery and getting a lot of good feedback from uh, from owners. And so she's here to kind of give that perspective. Hey, Savon. Hi, thanks so much for having me, Jordan. Well, I mean, technically you're having me. (laughs) So you're welcome. And thank you right back at you. Uh, Super excited. And we've done webinar together and uh, it was incredible. It's going to be a really great time. Uh, The other panelist that we have here is Waleed Cope. He probably needs no introduction because he is just the man. And he uh, he runs the soapbox in out in New York. Uh, successful pick up and delivery. He's got a very unique business model, which you'll hear about here in a little bit. Um, and he also is one of the co-hosts of the Commerce and Chill podcast. So make sure you check out that. And a sense customer, yes, but apologist, a sense aficionado, <laughs> a sense connoisseur. I don't know. <laughs> but Waleed, how's it going, man? Things are well. Thank you, Jordan. Uh, yes, super excited to have both of you guys, uh, here on Savant's <laughs> webinar, uh, and looking forward to having a really good time, but also looking forward to, uh, you know, learning a lot about pickup and delivery, sharing a lot of good information about pickup and delivery. Uh, and, uh, yeah, uh, Savant, where are you? Where are you located? Um, I'm actually based out of our son's, uh, HQ here in New York in Manhattan. Awesome. And Waleed, where are you at? I'm in New York also. Awesome. A- AKA the best coast. You'll know what that means, Jordan. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> uh, I think West Coast, best coast. Uh, all right. So we got both coasts represented. And uh, if you're out there in the middle, uh, hey, here we go. All right. Well, hey, let's jump in. I mean, I, I think people are here, you know, obviously because we're hilarious, but probably more so because they want to learn how to build a laundry pickup and delivery business or to expand and grow their laundry pickup and delivery service. So, uh, man, I thought, you know, I was thinking kind of how do we jump, you know, jumpstart this thing, get it going. And, uh, you know, one of the most critical factors in all of this is, uh, you know, in any business really is your employees. So maybe we can start talking about employees. How do we find good employees? What do, what employees do you need for a pickup and delivery uh, service? Let's start there. What, what employees do we need maybe when we're starting? And then maybe as we scale our business, what employees do we need to uh, run a pickup and delivery service? Uh, Well, lead dude, start us off, man. Well, you know, this may be the end of you hearing from Savannah or I, I don't know, but let's see. <laughs> That's it. I'm running this all the way to the end. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's a good question, Jordan, but you know, in our industry, as we know, it's, it's so multifaceted. So if we're saying what type of team members do we need to do a pickup and delivery? Well, we have to first look at the operations. Are, are we, doing the wash, dry, and fold ourselves internally? Are we working with a partner, AKA wholesaler? Um, Are we running out of our self-service store? So if we're looking at the traditional model, you're going to need some type of uh, attendant person to be in that attendant role who's doing the intaking uh, and processing of the order. And then you're going to need a team member who's going to be doing the wash, dry, and fold uh, which could be the same person that does the intake at a, like a self-service laundromat. And then the key piece is we're going to need someone to deliver the laundry, hence pickup and delivery. So 
you know, at a minimum, we're looking at like two to three people, but at least two different roles to make it easier. Someone on the attendant side who's doing the intake, wash, dry and fold, and then someone who's on the, the delivery side of it. Is that, is that all you had to say? That's it. Uh, <laughs> Succinct. I mean, you must be learning from, from Jessica there. Okay. Uh, so, I mean, but I think you made a great point, right? It's, it's very dependent on how you're running your business. Maybe Savon, maybe, I mean, I, I know you've seen a lot of different models and Waleed, I know you run a different model than that traditional model. So maybe Savon, you can kind of touch on some different types of models and maybe we can explore those a little bit. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. What are you seeing? Yeah. So first and foremost, the one thing I'll add is it's not just about how you're running your business, but the hours of operation that you're running, right? If you are a 24 seven laundromat, are you, what are your hours of delivery? How many time slots are you doing, if at all? And what, during which hours do you want your store attended if you even want to explore an unattended mat model? So there are so many different ways. I think it's tough to give a blanket statement of employees, but I think will lead is a really incredible example of how employee models or the soapbox rather not will lead is an incredible model of how your need for employees can change based on your business model itself. And I think one of the key components of being an entrepreneur and being in the laundry industry is a lot of trial and error. Like no matter what we say, you need to understand what works best for your business here. And we've talked to operators who have tried an unattended model for specific hours. It didn't work. They moved back to attended. They had in-house drivers, decided to go with outsource or vice versa, started with outsource, brought it in-house. Um, there are so many different ways, but I think again, the key point here is you have to be malleable, you have to be flexible and you have to be willing to adjust um, and have that insight into what's working well for your bottom line. So. Yeah. And uh, Waleed, why don't you talk just a little bit about how you're, how you're running stuff? Yes. Yeah, so our model is, is a little unique for the industry. Um, we've probably tried uh, all the current models. We've worked through all of them. So where we are currently, the soap boxes, um, we're totally attended through our hours of operations from open to close. But at our location, it's only a pickup and drop off location. So as the industry would call it a drop store. And at that location, we have a team member who's there the entire time. And they work closely with our delivery partners, uh, not delivery drivers, because we work specifically doing delivery using gig economy. Uh, I should say partnering with the gig economy, not using the gig economy. So all of our deliveries for our store and pickups are handled by DoorDash. We'll, we were doing a combination previously. Now we're 100% DoorDash. And then we'll be making another pivot in about another week, week and a half to a combination of our drivers along with the DoorDash model. And all of our wash, dry, fold, we process at a partner location uh, at several different larger mats uh, in the Brooklyn area here in New York City. So, I mean, if I'm hearing you right, you have a laundry pickup and delivery service and you don't really have any machines, is that? <laughs> yes, so, yeah. So if, if, we, if I had to use an example, we're probably the like Airbnb or the like Uber where they're providing a service, but they don't own any machine, any cars or any properties. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we don't own, we used to, we close our self-service store down and now we just do the pickup and delivery and drop off. So our business is hundred percent drop off and pick up and delivery. So it's all wash, dry, full. And we only do three lines of service. We do wash, dry, full, dry cleaning, and we do sneaker cleaning also. So that's it. Yeah. So not only do you currently not own any machines, but at this point in time, you also don't own any drivers and <laughs> bands and all that stuff. <laughs> like, like you got, you are, uh, you know, you're well, running like. Technically we got, we have one part-time driver who does our commercial accounts three days a week, but our commercial business is probably 40%, uh, let's say 30% of our business. So 70% of it is residential, which is all coming in through DoorDash. Yeah. And what I, I mean, what I love about this is that you are running a 
very unique model, but this whole thing, I mean, this whole business can be adapted. I mean, you will talk to, you know, 10 different pickup and delivery operators and you'll have 10 different business models a lot of times. And so, uh, I mean, as you guys who are here attending this webinar are listening to this, you know, you can contextualize this. There's no, you know, formula for this is the way that it's done successfully. There's a lot of different ways to, to run this business. So, um, okay. Uh, I, here's kind of piggybacking on that. And maybe Savon, you can, you can kind of uh, touch on this a little bit, but, you know, with different business models, there's different um, employee structures. I think, I think the employee and the sort of vehicle side of things is the big barrier to entry, right? In pickup and delivery, especially, you know, say if somebody has an unattended laundromat or maybe they don't have one at all and they just want to start a, a pickup and delivery service, um, that, you know, what, I guess, uh, you know, help us overcome some of these barriers. What, yeah. what are some ways that we can get started without having to put a bunch of money up front with no yeah. guarantee that that business is a going to take off or B that we're going to want to continue it after we've started it. Absolutely. I think that's a really valid question because one of the things that I actually just listened to the panel from a laundry conference a couple of weeks ago that was covering the same topic. And it was really interesting to hear some of the difficulties or hurdles that all of the pickup and delivery operators have had to overcome. And there's one common theme is really just doing like a test market or a test understanding. And one really great way to do that with like zero overhead, no vehicle, no nothing is enabling gig economy. Um, and it doesn't have to be like, we are full-fledged launching gig economy, pickup and delivery. We have an operator here in New York who truthfully doesn't have the capacity to process more orders coming in. So what they're doing is they're offering just on-demand return delivery. They're offering kind of a stealth adoption, if you will, of this experience, getting feedback, making sure that it's actually working for them. But more so than anything, they're getting the identifiers, the key points of where the people are who are ordering return delivery, where are they located? What are their average order values? How often are they ordering? And these key data points will give you the tools to identify if it's even worth you growing that. Do you want to market in specific areas? What days of the week do you want to enable this? If you are exploring bringing on your own vans and drivers, having these key data points without having the overhead to try to make up for, it can really just change the game. Really, data is everything. And I know that Will Lead is huge on data as well. Um, and there's a reason that his business has been, knock on wood, so successful is just knowing what areas you should be going into and not just blindly servicing a county or a zip code that could span you know, miles on miles. So again, just to sum that up, enabling gig economy, whether that's for pickup and delivery or even just return delivery, at least gives you those data points that will help you determine how you want to scale that leg of your business. Yeah, I think that's good, uh, good input. And I, I mean, I like the kind of the Swiss army-ness of the gig, the switch that Sense has, right? And, you know, I'm not pitch and sense right now, but yeah. has that, that switch where you can turn on the gig economy, start gathering some data, start testing out different areas, different zip codes, or start building up your business to where if you want to, and Waleed just mentioned, he is getting ready to, uh, you know, pivot again and bring back on some drivers to do a combination of gig economy and his own, you know, drivers. So, uh, you know, the, the, you know, the flexibility of being able to do that uh, is huge. Um, I think there's some other ways too. I'll just mention, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm not one of the panelists technically, but I'm going to mention, you know, you don't have to also just go full bore right off the bat, right? Like you can yeah. offer certain hours, you know, maybe three or four hours in the morning, three or four hours in the evening for, you know, drop off and or pickup and delivery. Um, you can, you can do it only on certain days. That way you're not having to ramp up zero to 100, 
Um, and you know, a lot of people who started pickup and delivery started as the driver and drove their own vehicles until they couldn't anymore. Right. And then when they couldn't anymore, that's when they went out and got a van. That's when they went out and found another driver, added more routes and those kinds of things. Um, I think of a uh, Daniel Logan. Who I, was was, I was just about to say, yeah, yeah, I wanted to, I wanted to highlight. I just saw that Daniel Logan, one of our favorite operators. Oh, he's out. here. He just, yeah, Col- yeah. a Columbia Pike laundromat in, um, in DC. Uh, he, that's exactly how he started it. He bought the laundromat. He started doing deliveries himself, full-time job before work, like six to 8 AM. And then it organically grew from there as demand started to grow. He wasn't servicing areas where there was no demand. And I think that again, that is, it's not like offer the service and people shall come. It's like, is it worth sending a driver out if it's further out is there the demand and if so build on that but don't just blindly say i have delivery from nine to five if you don't actually know what hours of the day will be high demand like work smarter not harder yeah i love that and well there's a couple questions for you i'm gonna let you go again here in a second but uh you know one of the the ways that daniel phrased it on the podcast he said he's He'll stand in the gap, right? And so if there's a gap, he he can't cover with the business by being able to afford hiring a new driver for a new section yet, a new zip code or whatever. Or if there's a gap where they can't afford to, you know, the business can't afford to buy a, a car yet or whatever, a van or whatever, that he'll stand in the gap until the business can support that. And then he'll pass that off. And I just love that sort of visual and that concept of standing in the gap. Um, and you know, Daniel is here. Actually, I just saw he commented, make sure if you, uh, real quick, I didn't even mention this, but if you have questions, put the questions in the chat. My job is to keep an eye on that chat and make sure these questions get answered. So with that Waleed, uh, and make sure it says to everyone, there's that little drop box, uh, drop down box. Make sure it says to everyone, uh, Waleed, a couple questions. Uh, do you, uh, okay. So are you renting a, a section of the laundromats that are doing, uh, the laundry, are you doing it with your own employees? How, how do you, how's that relationship working out with the, the people that you're contracting with? So, yeah, I saw a D Simone's a question come in there. So, but just to jump back when you talked about the question about, you know, getting into the pickup and delivery. So first and foremost, pickup and delivery is its own unique model. So people should be very cognizant and do their research to say, do I want to add pickup and delivery if they have a self-service business, if they aren't doing it yet? A lot of feedback I've heard or people get into the industry and they're just like, oh, I should do pickup and delivery because I have a self-service and they think they should just add it on top of it. And I don't discourage anyone from doing it, but I always say, make sure you, you know what you're getting into. Pickup and delivery is, I've seen people have it as a separate business model with their self-service. And then I've seen them incorporate into it. But what everyone you know, needs to understand when it comes to pickup and delivery, it's totally different than food delivery. We must remember that with laundry, and I can't think of any other business at the moment, I'm sure there are a few others out there, we're two-way. We have to pick it up, bring it back to our shop, process it, and then get it back to the client. It's a very unique model when it comes to delivery. You know, food services, restaurants, they're all one way. FedEx, UPS, everything is one way. Somebody places an order through e and it gets delivered to you. So, you know, it's, it's a lot challenging for us because first of all, expense-wise and then logistics. So I always encourage everyone to, to look into it and figure out how do you want to incorporate that into it. But using, you know, the gig economy gives you a lot of options. One, you want to test different markets. You can start doing pickup and delivery in a market and see, Sivan mentioned it earlier, to see what the response is going to be before you buy a van or you hire a driver or you stand in the gap. And I think that, you know, standing in the gap is, is great when you're starting out, when you're building, but we, we have to look beyond that and say, how are we building a business? How are we building a business system? How are we building this model? Because if we don't look beyond that, we basically just brought ourselves a job. So you, you're a multi-store owner, Jordan. You wouldn't be doing this podcast right now uh, sitting in your office. You would have to sit in the store because 
you mm-hmm. don't have a system in place. You haven't built the business. So I, I, I encourage everyone to make sure you look at that. But using that flexibility gives you the options of test markets to turn on pickup and delivery to see, take the temperature in your, in your area, the communities you want to service. And then as it builds up, you say, hey, I'm going to add my own drivers because there's, there's this um, school of thought that you can't use gig workers because they're not going to deliver a quality product. So you might say, hey, I want to test it with the gig worker, and then I want to hire my own driver because I want them to deliver a certain type of experience, which is, which is perfectly fine. And you have a combination or you use it as a backup because someone says, I need my laundry right now and all your drivers are already out on the route. So they just click deliver now and then a gig economy worker shows up, grabs it and delivers it right then and there for them and the client is satisfied. So go back to D. Simone's questions. We, we've done all those models that you've, mentioned there in the in the chat uh we were doing it ourselves during the day when we had our self-service store we started using about half the washers in the store during the day so our clients got mad at us so then we went to the model where we were doing laundry at night um then it still wasn't enough for us to meet the demand so we got to the point where we would shut the store down for a couple of days uh, the biggest, busiest days for drop off. And we would try and process as much as we could. And then we only use the store a little bit. That didn't start, that didn't work out after a while. We ran out of bandwidth on that because we, we had a small store. We had 27 washers and 28 dryers. Um, then we got to the point where we only opened the store on the weekends, which was our busiest days, like three days out of the week, Saturday, Sunday. And it was another day that we were busy during the week. And then we use the store the rest of it. Then we made the transition to um, completely shut the store down and we just process. And then we moved away from the store uh, and it go directly into where we are now, uh, D. Simone. We partner with three local providers and we actually go to their facilities. We train their team members. Our team members go there also um, to make sure everything is done the way we want it done accordingly. And we found it to be a great relationship so everything gets processed offsite. Everything comes back to our store for delivery or for clients to pick up who walk in and drop off. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, that's, that's great information and kind of going, you know, on that sort of evolution of what you're doing here. Uh, there's another question that rolled in that said, Hey, you know, you just mentioned you're, you're pivoting to bringing back drivers what what's kind of prompted that decision as you continue to evolve your business? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question to say, you know, why is this guy 100% gig economy and now bringing back? Well, to paint the picture, previously, when we started doing pickup and delivery, I was the first driver. I did that for whatever amount of time before I went to the office in the morning. And then I did it in the evening after I left the office um, for our other business. And I would just do deliveries to test it and see until it built up to enough. And I was like, okay, we'll hire somebody. Um, At one point we had six drivers and then we started using the Sense business management platform for our store because in the past we were using numerous platforms, one for pickup and delivery, one for in-store because no platform had all the features um, that we needed. And let's be clear, no SaaS product is ever gonna have 100% of all the features for, for your business but we needed to be somewhere around 90, 95%. And the the options we looked at at that time couldn't get us to 90 to 95. So we used two different ones. So we were doing double entry all day long. Every time a a delivery came in, we had to enter it into the POS in the store. Uh, So when we transitioned to Sense and we put everything in one platform, over time, some of our drivers just transitioned out, like one retired, one got married, et cetera, et cetera. So life just happened, it, nothing out of the ordinary. And as it happened, we said, you know what? Let's not just hire another driver. Let's keep pushing this DoorDash model and see how it goes. So seven months later, you know, we're hundred percent DoorDash and we're rocking and rolling. And the reason we're bringing on some new drivers is we want to capture more market share. And, it, and, I'm, and I'm calling it like it is, DoorDash is not, causing us any issues, any problems, it's working great, but we want to really drive down even more because there are some things that Dash you can't do uh, when they go into a building that works for us on the marketing side or to entice, I don't want to say entice, but to, to pitch our services. So 
a dasher can't go into a doorman building and have a conversation with the property manager or with the the doorman to say, hey, like, you know, who's who should I speak to in reference to putting some marketing materials or who can we contact here to say, can we do, you know, a, a laundry event here where we have a table in the lobby once a week or, you know, we could provide different services to the staff here. So Adasha can't do that. So that's one of the reasons that we're bringing back our own drivers because we, we want to put more of um, more of a finger on the pulse when we're going into some of these buildings because we just haven't saturated the market enough where we are. Uh, we're, we're taking the opposite approach where I see a lot of places, they're casting this big net. They want to, here in New York City, we go by boroughs. So they, they want to do all the boroughs. I'm really trying to just drill down and figure out how can I catch as many fish that are in our target audience just in, in our neighborhood. Like, and I, I've said it before, our neighborhood has 150,000 residents in it alone. Just the neighborhood that we operate in where our store is. So I'm like, how can we capture more market share there? Like, I don't need to look at Queens and Manhattan. All the, let's just, and I'm not even talking about other boroughs. I'm talking about my neighborhood. My neighborhood is Bedford-Stuyvesant. Next to it is Williamsburg. Then there's Bushwick, Crown Heights, et cetera. See, Vaughn's raising a hand. She's a, she must be from Williamsburg. But there's 150,000 people in Bedford-Stuyvesant. And Bedford-Stuyvesant is located in the borough of Brooklyn. So we're just talking about one neighborhood. How, how do we saturate that? And Sivan touched on that earlier when we talked about data. And that's a whole nother conversation and a whole nother webinar for us to talk about. But that is the, one of the main reasons we're bringing back um, full-time drivers because we have a part-time who does commercial, but a driver that's going to focus on uh, residential. Yeah, awesome. And there's some more questions. We're going to get to those in a second. But uh, man, I love, I mean, what I hear you saying is that you're looking for different ways to go deeper with your community as opposed to wider and that there's 100%. plenty of business to be had locally for you. And so you're looking for different ways to reach that community. And one way that you're doing that, I know you're doing a lot of different things. But one way that you're doing that is by bringing on your own drivers to give you more penetration into your community, basically. Yeah. Like it, it's, I'm just looking at some of the questions rolling and my mind is spinning and I'm scared yeah. to like cut my <laughs> mic off. Um, <laughs> <laughs> he will, he will. He'll yeah, press I, the off I, button I, for I you. Just, I got to watch the <laughs> clock and watch his finger. Um, <laughs> and for those you don't know, this goes back to a, a panel that I was on and Jordan was the host and he was he kept cutting my microphone off because I was just giving, I'm giving away too much knowledge. He didn't want me to spread the love too much. Uh. Um, but yeah, so Listen, if you think about it from a self-service point of view, you've got a store and you market it. Like Jordan, you market your store. What would you say the average distance? You, and you're in a city out in, in California. LA. I'm in South LA, yeah. Right, so what would you say the average distance someone travels to come to your store to do self-service? Uh, half mile or less. Right, and that's either walking or driving. And for us, I can't speak for you. I don't have a parking lot. It's all on street parking. When I had the self-service store mm -hmm. people, if people drove, they had to look for parking on the street or they unloaded while they double parked, brought the clothes in and then went and parked their car like around the corner or wherever. So most people walk to our store and they walk, you know, tops, maybe seven blocks, eight, if I'm lucky. So we, we think about casting that net. I was like, how do I drill down more to get the people who are willing to walk to the store? And we carry that same mentality over to our pickup and delivery business when we started it. And we did, you know, just to give some more context, we did pickup and delivery under our self-service roof. And then one day we had this epiphany um, and realized that we're serving two different personas. The, the drop-off clientele has a totally different perspective for their time than someone who's doing self-service. And we said, we need to have two different business models. So we created the soapbox, which was separate from our laundromat. And it was, we leased the space directly across the street. So our clients didn't even have to walk far to drop off their clothes. Instead of them coming to one building, they, I'll go across the street now. And we, we built it just to service them because they're a different type of clientele. And we wanted to provide that service and cater directly to them. So to go back to your point, yes, like we believe in being small, saturate that market. And then once we feel we've reached the level we want to be at, then expand into the next area 
and using the resources and profits from that first area to go into the next area versus just saying, oh, we're, we're going to do, you know, Williamsburg, Bushwick, and then drivers are running all over the place. You know, it, it's not optimal. It's not efficient. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of questions rolling in. Uh, Go for it. We're going to we're gonna jump into marketing here in a second because I think that's a big one. Um, and, and Savon, I'll, I'll start with you on that. Uh, real quick, though, I wanted to uh, see, remind me, Waleed, by the end to talk about margins using a secondary store because I think that's yeah, a great question a lot that. of people have. Uh, but we'll hold that one for a second. And then there's a question about, uh, you know, the, the quality, how do you, how do you ensure that DoorDash, Uber, Lyft drivers treat your product and customers respectfully and professionally different drivers every time. And I'll just real quickly say, number one, I mean, it's a different platform, right? And so you don't, and that's probably part of why Waleed is bringing on his own drivers, not necessarily that he has bad quality, but he wants more control over that quality. But the yeah. other thing is that these, these services build in their own quality control uh, in them, they have ratings and reviews and, and services too. And yeah, something may go wrong. You may have a driver that treats somebody rudely or something, and maybe you need to make that right somehow, even though that's out of your control. However, uh, you know, those, those platforms build in accountability systems, uh, you know, within their platforms. And so you benefit from that. And it's the same as, uh, even though it's a different thing, with laundry, it's similar to how, you know, a restaurant has to trust drivers to deliver the food and not knock it over. And, you know, the presentation's still good when it arrives at your house, you know, there's, there's that level of trust there too. However, it expands their territory, right? A restaurant can only serve a certain radius. We just talked about laundromats can only serve a certain radius. But when you offer this pickup and delivery and, you know, using gig economy, it, it expands your, uh, your reach there and opens up new revenue streams for you. So I don't know, Savannah, if you want to add anything to that. Otherwise, I, we go I, into marketing. I do. It expands it to 15 miles. So obviously that depends upon the serviceability in the area specifically for pickup from customer. So one thing that Waleed had alluded to earlier is that there's really no other industry that is doing two-way delivery, that is picking up an item and returning it back to the customer. It's really minimal. So across the board for gig economy, picking up from a customer's home is new. And with that, the service areas sometimes for pickup from customers are more limited because they're used to having one establishment, which is the store, the restaurant, the location that is returning the items to the customer's home rather than having a million pickup locations, which are the homes themselves. So that being said, DoorDash specifically services 15 miles from your store, which is enormous. You know, a bed where the soapbox is located is less than four miles from my home in Williamsburg. And I was never able to do pickup and delivery with Waleed until he enabled DoorDash. And all of a sudden I'm able to do DoorDash delivery for $8. Um, and it's incredible. The service is amazing, uh, but it just expands your service area that much more. Um, and I did want to pass it to Waleed because I saw Waleed say no when, um, when, when you first started speaking, Jordan. So I think you may have wanted to clarify something as well. <laughs> well, you know, it just goes to um, Suds and Drips questions. First of all, I think that's an awesome name. I hope that's the actual name of their laundry mat or their <laughs> laundry service because they spell Suds and Drips with a Z. It's, it's mad awesome. But, you know, you, the question is, you know, how can we ensure that like DoorDash, Uber, Lyft, um, drivers treat the product and customers respectfully and professionally. So listen, I'm a big proponent of this. You can't, you, you can't control anything. Let, let's be absolutely clear. Suds mm -hmm. and drips. We can't, you can't control when your washers go out of order. You can't control what your attendants are going to do if they're going to show up to work on time. Well, so we have an illusion of control as operators of a business, but we put things in place and, and we try to hire the best people and give them the parameters to provide a great, do a good job and provide great service. So to go into your question in detail, no, you can't control them. Just like you can't control your team members to a certain degree, but you can build relationships with the Dasher or the Uber. Cause what you need to understand is these gig work economy uh, team members, they live local. Like you're not getting a Dasher who's driving 
and I'll use us as an example, from, from Manhattan to Bedford-Stuyvesant to say, I'm just going to do dashing around here. Now, we might get a dasher who's in our neighborhood who's from Manhattan because they did a, a, a dash earlier that brought them into our area, and then they get a dash from us either to stay within the area or go back to Manhattan on their way back to where they operate out of or where they live. So th the key thing we found success with, one, with dashes, is to treat them as an extension of our team. So we have, we allow them to use the restroom. We provide different amenities for them, water, beverages. We provide snacks for them. It was cold during the winter, like really cold. We had some really brick days here. And we saw dashes coming in with no gloves on and carrying bags. We brought gloves and we gave all the dashes that came in through that cold period that didn't have gloves on, we gave them a free pair of gloves and they were just like blown away. New Year's, you know, we gave them all a card to say happy New Year's with a little bonus inside. Like you do these little things and then they become familiar with your establishment. I'll, I'll say this to everybody who's on the panel. The next time you're in any type of restaurant or place that uses a gig, uh, economy worker to supplement their delivery. I want you to watch how they treat them. Watch how they interact. I was in, I was in a restaurant a couple of weeks ago with Jess and this restaurant has a special window where all the, the gig economy workers have to stand outside in the cold, in the rain. They can't come inside their establishment. They just stand up. There's no awning. There's nothing for them to get out the elements. They just stand at this little window and wait for them to hand the bag to them. And if the order is not ready, they have to wait for them. One of the dashes came inside or Postmates or whichever platform he was operating on that, at that, for that order, came in and the lady gave him an extra side of rude. She's like, you're not supposed to be in here, go outside, et cetera, et cetera. Now to go to Suds and Drip's question, like how do I con control their professionalism, how they deliver the product? Well, one thing is I shouldn't treat them like crap because now they're pissed off at, at one of my team members or the establishment. And then when they go to deliver their food, they're probably gonna give a really bad experience because they had a bad experience. So the key thing we find is have a good relationship. Give them a good experience when they come in. Treat them just like the clients. You know, we, we have dashes who've written five-star reviews for our store on Google. Like, go figure that. Who would have ever thought a gig economy worker would write a review for the establishment they're just picking up an item from and delivering it to someone? Because it, it's how we treat them. And, and that's super important. And then you have a control mechanism in place. If things do go wrong, and Jordan mentioned that, these different platforms, we can rate them, as Jordan mentioned. And some of them have the capabilities of where you can have them blocked so they won't get any more orders from your establishment. But keep in mind, when you, when you build these relationships with them, we have dashers who just sit in front of our store and wait for orders to come in. We'll see the same dasher four, five, six times a day. So if they're coming in the store six times a day, they use the restroom, they get a snack, we get to interact with them. They tell us about, oh, that last client I went to, they were on the fourth floor and they said this. And then we get to interact with them and say, hey, you know, when, when you take this order, would you mind putting it at the rear door or doing this little thing or that for that particular client? And then sometimes I give them a tip too. And now they're just like, whoa, like they've become like, they're super loyal because we treat them different than they used to being treated at other establishments. Well, I mean... I tried to answer that one quickly. And... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I knew it was coming. I knew it. Sorry. No, I'm just kidding. This is a dilemma that I have with you, right? It's like, I try to shut you up and you don't, but then you say really good stuff and it's just, you know, it, it makes it hard to try even harder to shut you up, but I'm going to keep trying. So, uh, all right. So anyways, I mean, great stuff, man. Seriously. Like I give you a hard time, but like, like that's gold right? That's gold. Yeah. And, and that applies. I mean, all of that is not just for your gig economy workers, right? That's for your regular employees. All of that was just free gold that Waleed's given you. If you have a business and you even just have an unattended laundromat with a cleaner and that's it, right? Like that is just top-notch advice. And that's how you build a great business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you, you can start Listen, with this model, and I'm not saying everybody should go out and get sense and use gig workers. I, I'm just speaking from what our experience is. And I, I love trying new and different things. We, we love tech at our store. We love software. We, use, we love using technology. To, how can we wow our customer? How can we wow our client even more? Um, and, we, and we look at tech and we, we look to embrace it. But I, I would encourage anyone who's on this call or who watches this replay later on, 
you're, you're thinking about doing pickup and delivery and you're not in the laundry business. So you want to get into it. You, you could take a couple bucks and literally start a pickup and delivery business. Now, granted, you'll have to, you know, get some partners or if you have access to go to a local laundromat, but ideally you could launch a website, go daddy 999, right? You, you find a, POS provider slash pickup and delivery, whatever that might cost. The, the ranges vary throughout the industry, depending which platform you go with. But let's just say a couple hundred bucks, you know, just throw a ballpark number out there. So you're in 10 bucks for your website. And then your SaaS product, you're probably not going to have to pay until the billing cycle comes. So you can start today with it. You might have to buy some hardware, like a scale, et cetera, et cetera. But literally, you could start a pickup and delivery business with a thousand bucks. I know I can. Right. I could. If someone told me to go into another market today, I would assess the, the demographics where we want to be. And legitimately with a thousand bucks, I could just do pickup and delivery. Yeah. So if I went to South L.A., I'll call Jordan up and be like, hey, you want to work together and do some pickup and delivery together? And you strike up a partnership where we do the wash and fold in his facility. And then we're out in the street. You know, we're marketing and we use the gig economy workers to go out there and set the groundwork for us to get into that market to infiltrate it to to get those first couple orders and keep the expenses and run, and run a really lean shop yeah awesome awesome L let's talk marketing okay so i mean you you mentioned the website right we're talking this five steps right we've gotten to one uh so you know pick your business model and start with employees whether that's you're hiring somebody and or you are standing in the gap and fill in that role until it scales. Uh, real quick, you just mentioned, you know, step two, building a website. You got to have that online presence. You want to have a Google My Business account, you know, claim your Yelp account, keep those things updated. You can post to those continually and Google and Yelp and, you know, they love that. So keep doing that. That's step number two. I'm going to just skip that completely other than have a website and, and make sure it's a good one. You know, when you work with a company like Sense, you can get a website there. You know, we'll throw together a website for you. You can build one. Even in fact, I even have a webinar out there that, or it's a, it's a just a YouTube video that tells you step by step how to build uh, your own website. And there's a template you can download and do it yourself if that's the route you want to go. Whatever route you go, you got to have that online presence. Okay, so Savon, talk to me about. You know, we have this online presence now. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's a website. All that stuff. How do we how do we market a pickup and delivery company, particularly if we're starting from scratch? What, what do we do to market this thing? Talk to people, literally talk to people. That's the first thing I would say. And that's the one kind of common thread that I've heard from our operators who have successful in-house pickup and delivery businesses and, you know, outsource pickup and delivery businesses. They will literally go to their self-serve customers and say, hey, did you know that I offer pickup and delivery here? Use this coupon for 50% off your first order. Um, and by the way, I service you seven to 12 or whatever that might be, whatever your hours are. Talking to people is so important. Um, it's like with anything else in life, you want to tell people what, what you're searching for, like what, what, what it's about. And so get the clientele by advertising, by telling everyone you know what you offer. Um, and then I would say the bare minimum is kind of twofold. First and foremost, signage, not just in your stores, but if you are doing in-house like pickup and delivery with your own vans, again, Columbia Pike Laundry um, in DC, he has vans that are plastered all over with laundry pickup and delivery services. Call blah, 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 go to blah, blah, blah to um, place your order. And that's how Daniel got so much business in neighborhoods that he wasn't even servicing was just driving the van around and people didn't even know it was, it was an option. So really just having that visibility in your storefront. Um, Ariana from Lingerie in front of her store on the street. She's in San Francisco. Yes, it's an urban area, but she has one of those um, signs. Like, I don't know. It's like the, the A signs or a something. Frame. A frame, yeah, the yeah. frame, the A frame on, on the street. And it's like order pickup and delivery today. And it's a huge QR code. Someone can go scan and do laundry pickup and delivery. So really the multitude of ways that you can get the word out there with like these grassroots efforts are endless. Um, but beyond that, social media is an incredible tool. Um, and 
by simply, you don't even need to work with a digital marketing agency. You can go to Facebook ads. It's actually, it's pretty easy. You can go, you can boost a post on Instagram. You can choose the audience that you want to target and just literally throw a couple bucks in there and see what happens. And again, make sure it's just concise and it tells the person, your end customer, your prospective new customer, what it is that you offer. Um, so there's so many different ways, uh, you know, referral programs, anything like that um, in the store can just really, really drive business for pickup and delivery. Yeah. And I would say too, I, I you know, one of my business coaches, I was just talking earlier today and, you know, they were saying, whenever you're starting a new venture, look for the easiest thing to do. That's going to give you the biggest result. Right. And I mean, that's the first thing that popped in my head when you're like, talk to your current customers, right. The, your, your best, uh, your best pool of initial customers. And, you know, to Wally's point, your self-serve customers and your drop-off service, uh, service customers are a different dem demographic, unless your self-serve customers don't know there's an option that you'll do the laundry for them. Right. So offering that now, obviously not everybody's going to go for that because it's a different demographic, but you guaranteed if you have a self-service location you've got some lurkers in there that are would be willing more than willing to you know pay somebody else to do their laundry if only they knew the option was there right and if you incentivize it properly you know like you mentioned uh that's a low hanging fruit and as you continue to to grow your business even if you just have a handful of initial customers utilize them as your advocates as your salespeople, as your, you know, ambassadors and incentivize them to bring other people like them to your business, whether that's offering them another discount or them and their referral, another discount. And I would do that in every single laundry bag. I would drop a little flyer that says, Hey, you know, use this code or give this code to somebody. And if they use it, you get, you know, X amount of dollars off your next order and they get X amount of off their next order. Now, all of a sudden they're super happy because somebody else is doing their laundry, which is awesome in and of itself. And they're getting a discount and they're becoming a hero to their friends who also hate laundry, right? So look for those low hanging fruit that can give you the highest yield. And then you can start to get where Walid is, where he is, you know, utilizing that data because he's got data now, right? And he's able to tweak his business. He's able to try a whole bunch of different things to see what works best to really optimize the business. And yeah. one thing that Willie does incredibly well is social media marketing. Like, I mean, I'm going to not speak for him, but I'll let him speak to this, but his social media content is incredible. And I know that that's one driver mm -hmm. of business for him. It's a brand in and of itself. Yeah. I was over here while you two were talking about marketing. I'm just scribbling down all the things we've done and things we've had success with in some. And you both mentioned a lot that we did in the beginning and we still do now that we find super successful. And I see, you know, Stephen put a question up like, you know, how do we market pickup and delivery specifically? Um, and listen, it depends on how uh, hands-on you want to be or how you want to really dig down in the trenches. But Jordan, you touched on, I think the highest level ones that people should be doing that are super easy and it just takes time. There's no dollar amount involved. You should be on Yelp. You should claim your, your business on Yelp and you should fill out all the details, every single detail, the times, like the type of ownership, all the questions that ask you, you should fill it out. You should do the same thing on Google My Business. Do the same thing there. You mentioned it, Jordan. Google My Business is so free. I don't understand. And like, I'm giving away all the gems right now. I don't understand why small businesses don't post on Google My Business on a regular basis. You can post photos, videos, texts, events, specials. You can post all that just like you post on social media. You should be posting on Google My Business consistently. And I'm not telling you should do it every day, three times a week or four times. You need to find out what's good for you and your business, and you should post. And your question is going to be, well, lead, I don't know what to post. That's another webinar. But I'm just telling you right now, you should be posting on it. The other thing you should be doing is, if depending where your store is located, like you're in the suburbs of your city, if you're in a strip mall, or there's like a little shopping center, I would be going hard, depending on what the rules are, I would be putting flyers on people's cars in the parking lot of my strip mall. If my store was located in a strip mall, God help the people who park there 
every day because we would be all over their cars. They come out. <laughs> I would have someone outside like greeting them and tell them about our service. If you're really hardcore about it, you could park your van when you're not using it in other areas of your neighborhood and just leave it there. So people see it, be strategic about it. Go park it in the city. We, we, we would rent a U-Haul and put a big Vista print sign we had made on both sides of it in front of the subway stations in the morning and in the evening when people were going to work and people coming home. And they would see our signs plastered on the side of the U-Haul. And if I see U-Hauls out there now with this on it, I know where it came from. <laughs> we would do that, right? <laughs> and what it costs us, a U-Haul costs what, 19 bucks a day, depending what size U-Haul you get. So for 20 bucks and, and the cost of the sign, which I can use over and over, I park this truck, leave it on the street in a busy area and people see it. Then the other thing you can do is, Sivan talked about his signage. You should be going bananas with signage in the front of your store. And you should your signage should be specific. Tell, you know how many laundromats I, I go to or I talk to individuals who have a self-service and I hardly see any signs in their store or outside their store to say they do pick up and delivery or they do wash and fold. Like start with, with the basics. Jordan, you hit a, a, a real moneymaker referrals. You, you, and you should talk to your POS system. A lot of them have a feature where when someone signs up, they get a unique code and then they share that code with someone else and then they put it in and then it's a two for one. They get a little bonus for referring someone and then a the person who got referred gets a bonus on their laundry. You should have a website. Jordan mentions that. Um, I'm really big on flyers. Put them in their homes. And here's one place I'm sure a lot of us are missing the ball on. You should be advertising inside of every order that you send out. You have tremendous real estate in front of you. You have their clothes. When you close that bag up, you should be putting something in there to promote your additional service, to upsell them, as Jordan said. So if there are somebody had in the comments, is there an advantage or how should we market to our walk-in clients to get them to become pickup and delivery? What's the advantage to it? The advantage is there if you have a different price, you're going to have them paying more to use pickup and delivery than you're walking. So at us, I can't speak to everybody else. We have two different price points. If you bring it to the store, it's one price. If we pick it up and deliver it, it's a different price. So if I can convert someone from walking to a delivery, we get to make more money. Obviously, there's a larger margin and we get to spoil them more. We get to pamper them a little more because now we're giving them door to door service. So you should be capitalizing on the real estate inside those orders that you send out to them. Uh, I got quite a few others listed here, but I'm going to stop there before Jordan hits the wow. button on my mic. Wow. Wow. This is, this is like growth here yeah. now. I mean, but you make your point. I mean, like the marketing, it's all tactics. I love the like guerrilla marketing tactics. I love exactly. that. We should let's let, we need to, well, let's put one on the calendar a- where we do a marketing one and we need to do a social media one too. Cause I get that question all the time. Like how, what do I, what do I even post? Right. And but, so we should do one on that too. But with uh, social, like, listen, when we start social, right. You shouldn't have said social. Sorry. <laughs> I, I'm back in the game. <laughs> listen, when we started the soap, we, let me be absolutely clear. We built the soapbox on Instagram. And when I say mm-hmm. we built it, we built the brand. I had clients DMing me on Instagram, 12 30, 1 AM in the morning. Can you come pick up my laundry now? I'm like, Hey, it kind of doesn't work that way, but here's the link. Click on the link and schedule when you want our driver to come and pick up the laundry. We built it. And people are saying, well, I don't know what to post. Let me be absolutely clear to this day. Sometimes I still don't know what to post. But when we first started, I had no clue. There was a young man who lived in our neighborhood who, whose parents would come to our self-service, self-service store all the time. And he said, you should give me a job. Cope, you should give me a job. I was like, when you're old enough to work and he's in junior high school, whatever, when New York City said you can have working papers, I'll give you a job. Finally, when somebody runs in, he has his working papers, he says, I can work, give me a job. And I'm like, holy cows, what is this young man going to do for me? I gave him a cell phone and I said, I want you to follow everybody around the store and just take videos and photos all day long. And at the end of the day, I would just look at what he recorded and I'd be like, I guess this looks okay. And I would post it to social with some comment and some hashtags. And that was, I don't know, 2015, we started doing that. And here we are 2022 and we've evolved. And if you look at our feed, you'll be like, wow, that was some really janky stuff they posted in the beginning compared to what we do now. But you just got to start like so you should post something. And I would encourage you to post things that are going to connect people with your store. When I say that, humanize it, like don't just post pictures of washers and clothes. 
pe people in your store, do shout outs when your clients come in, take selfies with them, encourage them to post and then tag them, et cetera, et cetera. Like start with something. Love it. All right. So we've gone through business, you know, pick your business model, hire employees. We've got, you know, get your online presence going, your website, your Google, my business, your Yelp step three. We've got, you got marketing. There are a ton of different tactics. You are only limited by your creativity in the marketing, social media, you know, side of things. And there's more to come on that. I'm sure because you could also give discounts, Jordan too. See, First time see, client I discount told you more to to in, 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 <laughs> entice them to sign up. Yeah, you could do that too. Like I see a lot of places they give a percentage or a couple bucks off new cus new client, new customer, first order. So yeah. 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 So basically infinite number of ways to market, but you know, you got to do it. That's the thing is, you know, you got to do it and start collecting the data and figuring out what works. Okay. Number four, and we'll lead, maybe you can just give us a few like teaser ideas. Cause we're running, you know, we're running up against it here and, and we got a couple more things I want to talk about, but you know, we got, you know, you got to improve your operations, con you know, constantly. You got to continually improve there. Can you just talk about some of the things that you guys do, uh, you know, in terms of operations and on the customer service side of things? Just, you know, you talked about pamper. I love that pampering your customers, right? Like how, what do you, what kinds of things are you doing? So it's, it's so many. Um, and cli client support could be a whole webinar within itself. But some of the key things that we found success and we learned over the years is your clients need to be able to get in contact with you when there's an issue. Nine out of 10 times, I'm willing to bet here that your problems end up escalating. The, the situation gets worse when they can't reach someone to release the frustration of what's wrong with their order, whether it's a late delivery or a late pickup or they're missing a sock or they got the wrong bag or there was supposed to be three bags delivered and you only did it, delivered two because the driver forgot to look at the ticket to say it was, this is three bags and not two bags, whatever it might be. So where we found some success is give clients and people multiple ways to communicate with you and your team, and then take those multiple ways and figure out how to funnel them into one platform. So you're not looking at a text message. You're not looking at an email here. You're not looking at a chat message here from your website. So what we did is we opened up numerous forms of communication. Our clients or someone who's a prospective client can text us, they can email us, they can chat us through our website, and we have all of them connected to one, well, to two platforms now. So when a message comes in, we're able to track it right away, whether it's a question about becoming a client, whether it's a quote for commercial services, or existing client who has a question or issue with their order. So the one thing we use, we use a CRM system. So we use a help ticket system um, where when they, fill, when they send an email to our support email, it goes right into the system. It alerts all of us. I have an app on my phone. Like I just looked down at it twice because it just went off twice while we're on this call. Um, thank God it's no fire. It's just someone with a question. We also have texting on our website. We have a chat on our website that we link to text. So now all of that gets feed to one text number. There's an app on my phone, my computer, or my manager's phone on a tablet in the store. So we can answer those questions as soon as they come in. Speed is key. I cannot tell you how many commercial accounts I've gotten because someone sent us an email or a text to ask us a question and we responded to them very quickly and gave them a professional proposal, professional proposal, and then they chose us and they were like, wow, no one else even hardly got back to us. Or they just sent us an email with pricing. Proposals is another webinar we should do too. Um, efficiency. In the store, we have multiple scales. We look at every touch point and we try to minimize how many times we touch an order. So a dasher comes in, they drop it off in the front of the store. It goes right on the scale where they drop it. We've also utilized, there's a connection between our scales and our tablet, so the weight automatically gets inputted right into our POS. So we're not typing it. We're eliminating the margin of error. I've had a attendant who put one too many zeros on a 30 pound order, which translated to 300 pounds. And when a client's credit card got charged, they called me really quickly and was like, wow, you really increased your prices. The service must be really good. I'm like, yeah, we wash clothes in spring water now. You just don't know. <laughs> Imported from the Fiji Islands. Um, but yeah, so we had to you know, fix that. But that makes it super efficient. We also document everything. And I see this in a lot of, not just laundromats, in a lot of small businesses. 
we're, we're guilty of not documenting the processes. And we have team members who come in and we train them and they, they make notes or they scribble it down or they memorize everything. And the, the one key I would lend it to is I had a, a, a good friend slash family member who owned the McDonald's. And I looked at their systems and I was like, anybody can do this. When you looked at the cash register, there was a picture of a burger. There was a picture of a small fry, a large fry. And then when you opened up their manual, it was step one, step two, step three. So documenting you know, the procedures is something we should definitely be doing and looking at whether it's pickup and delivery or and our self-service. I got more, but I'm going to be quiet, John. <laughs> wow. No, I mean, you're right. There, there's a, so much that goes into improving these operations, but the key, I think from what I'm hearing from you is, you know, do the best you can to get started and then learn from it, grow, right? right? Build and on it. similar to the social media stuff, right? Early on, you know, it might be a little cringy, <laughs> you know, it might, you may not, you may make a lot of mistakes, right. And have to issue refunds or have to, you know, call people back and apologize about stuff. I still have to do that in my business, right? Like that still happens, but as you learn and grow and implement systems and document those, uh, you start to eliminate those things and you continually are improving and it takes a time and effort investment to continue to do those things. Yeah. And the other thing we do is we, we have our team members actively document things in the store when they have an issue. Here's another piece I, you know, we didn't talk about was like teamwork. Are, are we having routine team meetings and team building exercises in our store? And when I say that, it doesn't have to be like some big corporate America type thing where every two weeks we have a meeting in the store and everybody gets to talk freely. I'm, I'm not the boss. I'm not the team lead. You could tell me right now, listen, this sucks. Like we need to change this. We should move the scale from this side of the store to this side. The screen is too small. We need bigger screens. Or, you know, this customer said this and we should change this to service them better. Like we should be engaging with our team more to, to hear what they say. They're on the front lines. Like I'm, I'm not in the store every day. So all of these things that we've been talking about so far, these first four kind of steps, they all bring, they all kind of come together and, and hinge on your operating system, right? And, you know, the old school kind of way of doing that, and I still see this happening like way too often is the old pen and paper model, right? But as, you know, as Waleed's talking about, we're trying to minimize touches. We're trying to automate as much as possible to reduce errors. You know, we're trying to, you know, have CRM systems and ways to communicate, you know, with customers and stuff like that. All of that now, can, can be wrapped up into a software system to help you, you know, roll out this business to help you, uh, you know, serve your customers better to improve efficiencies more, you know, to help your employees know what to do, how to do it to make it a repeatable process, sort of that e-myth revisited franchise model esque, right? And so, you know, Savon, maybe you can chat a little bit, obviously, you know, we're on a sense webinar here, and we're going to talk about sense. Uh, but Maybe you can talk software systems in general. What should people be looking for as they're looking for a software system and, you know, and how that's going to help them either start or improve their business? Absolutely. So, um, you know, there are a couple of components and considerations to take in place, but first and foremost is just understanding your business model and what system would work the best for your business model. Um, as Walid has said a couple of times, no one software solution is going to cover everything about your business, but what can you work within, right? Um, are you looking to explore pickup and delivery? Make sure you have, or are utilizing a system that has pickup and delivery. Are you new to the game and want to start with gig economy? Make sure you're using a system that supports gig economy. You know, you have to understand what your goals are for your business and then kind of shape your software selection accordingly. Um, also making sure that you have the data points that you need, the reporting, the driver management, um, any sort of like uh, customer information so that you can market or pull it into a CRM. 
Um, and I think ultimately what's been most important for me, I think for Walid as well, is just our communication with our customers, the support that we provide, and the voice of the customer and how that impacts our product itself. So for me, that's hugely important. That's something that we kind of pride ourselves on. We literally have a weekly call with Walid um, and pick his brain and talk about things. Um, and so I think that that's the most important, but really just understanding understanding those core components. How are you running your business? How do you want to run your business? And making sure that your um, software can support that. Yeah. And while lead somebody who's tried, if not all the softwares, who's tried plenty. Uh, I mean, what are, what are the kinds of things that you think people should be looking for in a software solution as they, you know, are either trying to start or scale their business? Yeah. Th there's a lot. Um, of course, I mean, coming from we're you. probably on our, um, <laughs> I think we're on our sixth platform, um, for POS business management for our store. Hopefully our last, um, <laughs> I like the little but, threat, you know, <laughs> yeah, I know just, right. I, I was just thinking about when, when Alex was on the panel and he, he mentioned that, um, he's like, listen, Wally well, gives it to us straight. And, and that's one of the things that I like we can have those open conversations about what the platform is doing, what the platform is not doing and what we would like the platform to do in the future. So th that's the most important thing for me with, with any SaaS product. And I have other businesses, we use multiple SaaS products there. And the first important thing for me is the relationship. So you, you, you mentioned Jordan, what's on our short list, the relationship. Can I reach customer support by phone if I have to? There are quite a few POS systems out here uh, in the laundry space, we'll drill down that I've used and I can only email them or chat them. And sometimes I get a response a day, two days later. Well, you know, if it's Saturday and it's 6 p.m. and I got a client who needs their laundry delivered and does not hang up with the system, I kind of can't wait two days. So then, you know, I got to take matters into my own hands. I'm also going to look for a platform that has probably 90% to 95% of what I need it to do. Pick up and delivery, self-service. I want those components to be on one platform. My life does not need to be separated amongst many platforms anymore. So I'm looking for something that is all in one, 90, 95% again. I wanna look for a platform that has scalability. As my business grows, I want that platform to be able to grow with me. I also want it to provide me with the tools to grow my business. I want them to have the, the wherewithal and, and the ingenuity and the technology to say, hey, you aren't doing this. Have you ever thought about this? This could, we see other operators who are on our platform doing this and they're successful. Maybe this is something you wanna try. And I, the support is super important, but I, I'll add this to it. And I've had a lot of conversations with SaaS POS providers in the laundry industry. I don't ever want a SaaS platform that tells me what I can't do. And I've heard that a lot. I understand that the software can't be indoor, can't be everything to my business. But I've had these conversations where they're like, oh, you can't do that or you shouldn't do that. Like, oh, nobody does that in the laundry industry. Listen, I'm trying to do things that are different, that fit our market, that fit the way we want to operate. And that might not be the same throughout the industry. You know, we're, we're in, we're in the, the small percentage of the laundry industry. I don't think there are too many operators and I would love to see what data CLA has on it that are just pick up and delivery. I, I know of a handful here in my market that I'm close to, and I can I imagine there's a few others, but as a whole, the industry is probably dominated by self-service store owners, multi-store owners or single store owners that add pick up and delivery, you know, to there. So I, I want a software operator who's going to have that foresight, who's going to have good resources behind them too. Let's be clear. I don't, I've been on SaaS platforms where I got an email that six months later, they were shutting down. And I was sitting here trying to figure out what my next move is going to be because they ran out of, they ran out of funding or they weren't profitable. Like that's super important. Like people forget that. And I'm probably going on a tangent here, but you're entering into a partnership with your SaaS provider. They're warehousing that data, which is more valuable to me than the machines that were in my store, than the, than the real estate. That data is super important to me. So I wanna make sure that they're gonna be around in one form or another 
six months from now, a year from now, as I grow my business. So those are the things I have on my short list, but I probably got 10 more. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, no, I mean, I think those are great kind of criteria to be thinking about as you know, we we're concluding here in the chat over, there's going to be a link. If you're somebody who's either looking to start a pickup and delivery, uh, man, that was, that was fast. That was like real good. Wow, you just popped up like I feel so powerful right now. Like, man, I wonder what else. Like the there's, gonna, there's also going to be a link to a video of a unicorn over here, here pretty soon. So, you know, look for that. Uh, no, uh, I mean, so that's the link. If you want to, you know, if you're looking to start a pickup and delivery, or if you're looking for more from your software, whatever you're at, and you want to go see if Sense maybe uh, is uh, a solution that's going to help you grow. <laughs> <laughs> it's a funny. unicorn join. Uh, <laughs> uh, if you want to see if Sense is a platform that can help you scale your business or start your business, uh, there's a demo there, a link to the demo there. Go try it out. And I suggest that you you try out the software and you go get a demo from, you know, from multiple different places and see, I don't know if 100%. I can say that on your webinar, but no, but, you absolutely can see what works best for yeah, you. And see what's going to fit sure. your business. Yeah, you're fit, see what's going to fit your business model because you know, while I think Sense is pretty confident, why I think that Savon doesn't really have a problem with me saying that is because they're pretty confident they're the best and they're going to continue to be the best because they're driving real hard to, you know, develop a, a very robust platform that is, you know, easy to use. Um, and so, uh, but go try them out and talk to, you know, the people who are putting these things together, because I think just as important as the software is, is the people behind the software that you're going to be working with that you're going to be giving <laughs> you know, giving your feedback to that's going to be implementing the things that you need to help your business succeed. And I see Waleed nodding his head and Savan nodding her head. Right, go ahead, Waleed. Go ahead. Listen, you said it. <laughs> listen, all I can say is the, the people, listen, the product is important, but the people behind the product are even more important. And I'm saying that for anything. And people should be thinking about this for their laundromats also, because we're providing a service. So your people behind the counter that interact with, you want good interactions. You want people who are going to be there for you who are not just taking your money and brushing you off. And to answer Michelle's question in the chat, our CRM system is not connected to Sense, but Michelle, you should type it in the questions again. So someone at Sense will add that to their product development roadmap because mm -hmm. that would be huge for us. And Michelle, mm -hmm. we use a software called Help Scout. Um, super small business friendly and super affordable. So do, we, so do we on the email side for our, for our help tickets. Right. So it should be a super easy integration there. Yeah. <laughs> hint, hint. partnership already. Yeah. Wow. Get the API going. Exactly. Come on. Let's get an open API here. Yeah. That's right. Uh, okay. I mean, awesome. Dude, both of you guys, so much good information, so much good stuff for, you know, people who are looking to start pickup and delivery and for people who are running pickup and delivery and are just looking to level up. So uh, I don't know, Savon, do you want to leave us uh, with anything on the way out? Um, no, just if I encourage you to explore platforms that will help you grow and scale your business effectively, efficiently. Usually that means moving to technology as scary as it might be. And I do want to say being a business owner is a lot of hard work. Unfortunately, you do have to do the work yourself. This is your bottom line. Um, you can always bring in people to help you, but get your Google My Business account done, get your Yelp review done, print out some signage and talk to people. Honestly, just do it. Yeah. And real quick on the, on the technology being scary. I mean, it can be scary, but technology is meant to help you run your business and and to make it easier not to make it more complicated right not to make it more difficult to run your business it's meant to help you make it easier to run your business and while there might be a little bit of a learning curve especially if you don't use any technology right now uh it's it's worth the investment to to put in that learning because you know picking the right software is going to make your time more efficient. It's going to make your business more efficient. It's going to let you serve your customers more. And, you know, ultimately it's going to improve your bottom line, the, the money that you're taking home, you know, from your business and the value of your business also. So it's kind of a double whammy there. Well, lead, you want to leave us with anything? Uh, you Maybe nailed one, it. One thing. Like, listen, we used to write paper tickets and it, we switched from writing paper tickets to going to a computer. Um, and I remember our first POS system, we saw a dramatic improvement in the bottom line. 
I'm willing to bet a lot of operators are losing money and we're not even going to count employee theft. Let's just leave that off the table, but just due to errors from calculating and, you know, writing papers or papers falling off bags, using triplicate tickets, listen, embrace technology as much as you can um, and use it to your advantage. It will help your bottom line tremendously um, using some type of platform and streamlining your operations. All right. So that link is in the chat there, uh, trisense.com slash demo. And uh, hey, go try it out. Go meet the people. Go, uh, you know, behind sense. Go, you know, see what the software has to offer and go see if it's going to fit your business model and help you either start a laundry pickup and delivery or scale your, your pickup and delivery business. All right, guys, you guys rock. Thank you so much for sharing so much. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Was a it. pleasure. Thanks for yeah, having me. Look at it. Markenzie thinks you guys are awesome. Yeah. Look at this. Oh my gosh. Thank you, Steven. We'll see you next week. I hope. <laughs> All right, guys. Appreciate it. And uh, Hey, we'll see you at the next webinar. I'm, I'm assuming we're doing one next month. So come join us next month at the next webinar. Thank you. Thanks. Take care, everyone.